Hi guys, my name is Amanda Zitto, and today we're doing a Q&A, or at least part one of a two-part Q&A, since I am terrible at giving short answers. <laughs> Thanks everybody who has submitted questions. Let's get started. At Annette Motorbiker asks, what is your biggest concern when going on a long motorcycle trip? Let's see, my biggest concern is probably always money. If I have enough money to go, or what my bank account is gonna look like when I get back. And then it's whether or not I have the right kind of gear to do that trip. Then probably whether or not my bike is in decent enough shape to go and what I need to do to it before I leave. Matthew Carmen asks, if you're solo traveling, is it better to bring a smaller packing one person tent or should you opt for a slightly larger packing but more internal room two person tent and why? I think it's super personal preference and what kind of bike you're riding. If you're riding like a dirt bike, I would 100% say a one person tent because they pack down so much smaller. But if you're on a like big adventure bike, like a tiger, like I know that you ride Matt, I definitely think two person tent. Personally, it's so worth the comfort and the room to bring everything into your tent so it's not outside. And there are a lot of great companies that make tents that are packed down a little bit smaller. Like Iron Horse Gear makes tents with tent poles that are much shorter so they like will fit in most saddlebags. Unlike normal backpacking tents that we normally buy that are like like this long or something like that. I actually gave my Iron Horse gear one person tent to my brother and he likes it a lot. He used that on his trip to Portland and back from Montana. So I guess it's definitely a personal preference, but if you're going to be gone for more than a week, I think that the luxury room of having a two person tent, especially if you are gonna have to deal with weather or anything like that, it's a lot nicer to have to spend the day in a two person tent while it's raining than have to be squirreled away in a one person tent or have to buy a hotel room. That is a really long winded answer for a simple question. <laughs> Punishers California. Hi, we admire you, thank you and the many talents you have. During your pilgrimage series, Lazarus broke down more than once and you got in there diagnosing and fixing it with minimal resources. Are you self-taught how to do it or do you have any formal mechanics training? Do you service your motorcycle yourself? Keep them videos coming. We are always looking forward to them. Thank you. Thank you. The short answer is that I am self-taught. I don't have any formal training whatsoever. I wish that I did. I toted my manual around with me everywhere and if you can get your hands on a manual for your bike, I highly, highly suggest it. And I don't mean like the owner's manual, I mean like a manual like Chilton or Hain where they break everything down step by step, how to pull stuff apart and how to diagnose it with pictures and stuff. So that's how I fixed most of the stuff on my bike, but also I, uh, the kind of general rule when trying to fix things, especially on an older bike, is that everything needs fuel, air and spark. So I always start with fuel because that's the easiest thing to check. But no, I don't have any formal training. Me figuring out with my manual or asking my brother and dad to help me try to figure it out and they don't have formal training either. But my dad has had a lot of experience trying to fix stuff. Like he was handyman at a hotel for a little while. He fixes all the bricks on the property. So between me and my dad and my brother, we have most things handled. <laughs> do you service your motorcycle yourself? Um, uh, yes and no. I do service Lazarus myself because in my experience most people don't know how to work on older bikes and the few people who do know how to work on older bikes cost a lot of money and even then I've had mixed experiences with those mechanics so I kind of just work on Lazarus myself it seems to be the best option because at least if I mess it up I know what I did and if I take it to somebody else to have them fix it most of the time if they mess it up they don't tell me all of the truth of uh, what they did so it's just better this way. Uh, <laughs> As for my newer bikes, uh, when I first got Briarios, I was taking him to the shop to get service to maintain my warranty, but when I broke my radiator, I replaced that myself. And then since I do work at a Harley and Triumph dealership, just about everything that uh, has been done on Astraeus has been done at the shop um, because as an employee, I get a discount. And I haven't changed any tires myself. It, at this point, it just isn't worth the hassle for me because I don't have a tire stand. I don't have a way to balance the tire or anything like that. So since I work at a shop, I just kind of have the guys in the back do it for me. So it's kind of 50-50. Like every, I do everything on Lazarus, but on the newer bikes, if it's like tires or oil changes and that kind of stuff, I normally have the shop that I work at do it. It's just easier to have somebody else do it, especially because I have been swapped with commissions and making videos and uh, trying to get ready for the California BDR. <laughs> Annie Ruckus asks, with so many places, how do you choose where to point yourself next? 
Uh, this one is so hard. I spend a lot of time daydreaming and every time that I find somewhere that I would really like to go or I see a really beautiful place on Instagram or something, I will start on Google Maps. And in the wintertime or when I can't go anywhere, I spend a lot of time making imaginary trips. Like I'll use Rever and Google Maps and make uh, these like one or two week trips that I would really like to go on. And when it comes time that I can actually go somewhere, I will kind of like look at what time that I have to work with, like how long I can be gone and how much money I have. And I'll kind of dig through those trips and then kind of modify it to work in a way that it would be best for me. I also kind of struggle because every time that I actually get time off to go do things, all that I really want to do is go back to Montana. So I definitely have a lot of stuff in between Portland and Montana that I have like picked out and started and that kind of stuff so that every time I go home I take a different route. Ranger Rigger asks, how do you plan for trips? Any tips on how to plan for a two-day trip, short trips? Um, I actually wrote a article for Nice Adventure about how I plan my trips, um, how to plan for shorter trips when you only have a certain amount of time, and I'll link that down below. Um, I'm also planning on making a whole video about this because I get this question quite a lot, actually. But I guess the short answer is that I use this equation where I do the miles that I can do per day and times the amount of days that I have to work with, and that kind of gives me the range of mileage that I can do in that amount of time. I also use Butler Maps and rubber in combination with a bunch of places that I have saved on my Google Maps and then I use those to kind of make a route that I would really really like to do and then I make a budget based on that and then I kind of trim things here and there until I get to a place where I can have a reasonable amount of miles to do per day in combination with as far as I can go with my budget. I think that my biggest tip that I could give anybody who is working with like doing weekend trips or you know three or four day trips is that you should not underestimate yourself. You could probably go farther than you think that you can but also be really realistic about the miles that you can do per day and how much time you're going to take looking at sites and taking breaks and really giving yourself time in the mornings and the afternoons to kind of relax. Remember that like this is a vacation and you should treat it that way. <laughs> Doodle on a motorcycle asks, how did you get into traveling solo on your bike and what did you do before you did that? I think I got into traveling solo out of necessity actually. When I started riding, I didn't really know anybody else who rode besides my grandpa and he didn't really have time to ride with me. And part of the reason I got the bike was to make the trip back and forth from Portland to Montana a little bit cheaper. And after that, it was kind of like, I got used to being by myself. It's nice to be by yourself. I didn't have to wait for anybody. I didn't have to work around anybody else's schedule. I could just go whenever I wanted to go, you know? I didn't have to worry about other people being uncomfortable or having to work around somebody else's comfort level. That sounds super selfish, but I guess I am. What did I do before that? I'm assuming that you mean like, how did I travel before that? Or like what my job was before that? I drove around in my car by myself. So I was already kind of traveling solo. So I would drive everywhere in my 1992 Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra. And I loved that car to death. It was such a great car, but traveling a, like long distance is really expensive in it. It's like a giant boat if you don't know what an Oldsmobile looks like. <laughs> And I was in the middle of art school when I learned how to ride. Right before I started my apprenticeship at the tattoo shop, actually. I think that answers your question. <laughs> Jeremy Thorne asks, what's your favorite two-lane road you've rode so far? Uh, can I pick like five? <laughs> so excluding obvious ones like Beartooth Pass and Lolo and going to the Sun Road. Number one I think would be Pioneer Mountain Scenic Byway. Um, it goes from Polaris to Wise River in Montana and I think it is a severely underrated road that it was it was beautiful. It also happens to be the road that you turn off of to go to Coolidge, Montana, which is now one of my favorite ghost towns because you can ride through it on the motorcycle. The next one would probably be a red dirt road that I rode in eastern Montana. It was in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing around it. I think it's like Highway 340 or Ismay Road or something between Glendive and Plevna. And there isn't a whole lot of red dirt roads in Montana, so I think the, like, novelty was probably part of why I liked it so much. Then I think number three would probably be Highway 218 in Central Oregon from like Shanico to Fossil. It's just a really really beautiful road and it passes this uh, monument called like the Palisades or something. It's just such a good road. I love Central Oregon roads in general. <laughs> number four would probably be 
Forest Road 92, I think that's what it is. And it goes north out of Yak, Montana, which is like the north, north, northwest corner of Montana. And it's a paved forest service road. And it was gorgeous. Ah, just, it was amazing. And last, I'm going to cheat and say like every forest service road in the Tillamook National Forest, like seriously, just pick one and like putter off. And the landscape is incredible. I have never been disappointed riding any road in the Tillamook National Forest. Any recommendations for a city suburb bike need something to scoot to work with from KNP, AKA Jackie. Oh man, like, what is your budget? Hands down, probably the Honda Rebel 300. I think it is a, an amazing bike. Moto Lady has one. I've test ridden a couple and I think that's plenty of power to, if you're just commuting back and forth to work. The Honda Grom is a good option. The Kawasaki Z125 is a good option. They're really little bikes, but if you're just tooting around town, like commuting back and forth to work, you don't need more than 500 cc's. Otherwise you're kind of taxing the battery a little bit too much because you're not going far enough to charge up the battery off the stator but i mean if it's super short like you could totally get a scooter i know i'm gonna get hate for that but like i feel like scooters are really good commuting options because they have built-in storage underneath the seat and they're super easy to ride Thank you guys so much for watching. This is only part one. Part two should be up very soon. A huge shout out to everybody who has donated on Ko-Fi and supported me on Patreon so far. I really appreciate it. If you enjoy my content, you can support me on Patreon for as little as $1 a month to get early viewing access to videos like these. If that's not up your alley, you can buy me a gallon of gas on Ko-Fi. Or if that's not up your alley, I also have shirts and prints and mugs and stickers with my motorcycle art on them on my Redbubble shop. All of these links are down in the description. And if you can't do that, just know that I appreciate you watching my videos. Thank you for being here. I do really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys for the next part in this Q&A.